Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. She's been on our show, and she is just amazing. I had to have her back because she just has a whirlwind of information to share with the, the world, and her information is very valuable. Mary Jackson has two children with autism. She is a advocate for children and families with autism. She focuses on parenthood and she has such great input and you don't even have to have autism. It really applies to just parents in general. You could apply this to people with disabilities, to just regular parenting. It, it just, it, she, she covers the spectrum. So listen with your ears, absorb her information because she has such great stuff to share with us today. And before I begin, I just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor. It's DMA World. Com. Now, they are a marketing consultant agency run by a gentleman named Mark. Mark doesn't like people to get scammed. He feels like the world, um, the marketing world, the industry itself has a lot of big marketing companies that take advantage of small businesses, and he wants to focus on those small businesses and help them grow. So check out dmaworld.com and ask for Mark, and he'll be very happy to talk with you and help you through your journey of building your business into a successful business. So Mary, tell us everything, you know, give everybody a little feedback about yourself. Let every, people who haven't heard you in the last show, tell them a little about yourself, what you do, and then let's get it, dig really deep into what we were talking about previously, because there's so much to share and you have so much great advice. Mm, Stacey, thank you so much. And thank you for the introduction. And um, I really appreciate it. Um, I, so I'm a wife. I am the mother of three children. Two of my kids are on the spectrum. So I have been advocating... I, I, you know, we start advocating once we're pregnant because we we have to make sure we do the right things for our baby and ourselves. Yeah. Um, my oldest is 23 and was never diagnosed with sensory issues. Yet she has struggled her whole life with those. But back then they weren't diagnosing as much as they are today, yeah. which we, you know, new data says one in 36 kids is diagnosed with autism by the age of eight. And it's mostly male. Now that is, we're trying to change that, you know, so that the female, um, part uh, of our world doesn't get left behind. It's just that with, with girls, it, it shows up, you know, there are several things that show up. Um, and just to say a snippet about that, it's usually bulimia or anxiety or depression that usually shows first before they can get to the diagnosis of, of autism. So they're trying to correct that. Anyways, um, I am, am a children's author and I write for adults as well. My focus is empowering kids and, and empowering uh, through language and storytelling and um, also through uh, positive words to get little ones started on language, positive language really early. I'm an ambassador advocate for Autism Tennessee. They serve 60,000 plus families. And um, I really love working with them and I get to go out in the community. I set up events, you know, I get to, um, I meet all kinds of people that are looking just like we were talking about before we started the show here, you know, just things that they're looking for, like even to hire people with uh, disabilities or challenges and they want to be more accessible to that community. And they're not really sure how, yeah. um, I've also been able to, uh, make sure our library is more sensory friendly by helping to create a, a sensory room in our library here locally, which was really, um, such an honor to be able to do. Yeah. And they were not, you know, they had not even really, it's not that they hadn't done anything in the library to be sensory friendly. They just hadn't done what would have made it more accessible for all families to come in. Right. You know? um, and it's important, even our disability community, we want kids to understand literacy, to understand and know the love for it and how important it is in their life, whether they're, doesn't matter where they are, like you said, on the spectrum of uh, challenges. But <clears throat> so um, I uh, have really had a, a beautiful walk with that. My um, children have been an incredible um, uh, education and tools for me in my life and resource. I had no idea what journey I was getting myself into when I had children. I just knew I wanted them. Yeah. I was told I couldn't have them. We tried seven years. I had four pregnancies, three babies. Um, and each of them I consider a miracle. So it's an honor to be a mom for me. I look at it like a job, you mm -hmm. know, and my responsibility is to try to always um, I guess be the best version of myself. I can be, I am not perfect. None mm -hmm. of us are, but because 
we're the first things they see in life and experience, we really do have a responsibility. I think sometimes it gets forgotten that, wow, I really can't do that in front of my children. Right. Say those things because then they're going to do that and think it's okay. It's yeah. it's never a like, don't do as I do, do as I say anymore. It's right. like, you know, they're like minor birds, you know? Yeah. And so we have to be really careful about that and responsible um, because, you know, we, we want to teach them how to have a healthy relationship one day when they get married. So if children yeah. are watching parents fight all the time, they're going to believe that's what their life should be. Yeah. And it's not what their life should be. No. So, you know, it's good for kids to see, and I know we're getting a little off track here, but yeah, go ahead. It's good for children to see parents if they argue but are able to work it out. Yes. Then parents who don't work it out walk off are very abusive. I mean, there is no excuse for that in front of a child ever. Oh, for sure. I don't care who you are, right? Yes. So um but my back to the the advocacy journey part of things, um, I one of my children went through a tremendous trauma at five in this, the special ed classroom. So I, that took my journey on a different um, pathway of seeking to change law in the state that I live in. Yes. So that changed my life completely, not only as an advocate, but as a mother and a human, because when your child is damaged at the hands of someone else, you, um, psychologically, what it does not only to your child, cause that that's a whole different story. That's, yeah. that's a lot. Uh, but for you, I know for me, I then lost trust in everything. Yeah. Uh, people, I was afraid to let my kids go anywhere, be with anyone else. Cause in my mind was, if it happened in public school, then anything can happen. Oh yeah. So that was a long journey for me to come back to a place of trust and right. something I still am challenged with and rightly so, you know, yeah. but, uh, um, but so I, I ended up going on a path with that, that, that enriched even more of the, um, advocacy work, but I, um, I'm also have done live streaming for five and a half years and podcasting. So I interview authors and I interview folks in the disability community as well to let people know what kind of resources and tools are out there. Cause I felt so alone on my journey, which yeah. I'm sure you did too. Yeah, I did. So for me, it's part of way of giving back, you know, like saying, I don't want you to feel as lonely as I did. Cause it is a lonely road. You don't, oh, have, yeah. your kids don't have the phone calls coming in. Can you play? Can you do this? Can you do that? You know, they don't have it at school sometimes. Um, and so as parents, you know, I, I have, I have parents who are in the typical world and parents who are in the non-typical world or the, yeah. you know, and I, I don't like using those terms, but it's the best way to describe it. And the experience is really interesting with both yeah. sets of parents. Oh yeah. Two different worlds. <laughs> it different is two world. different worlds. Yes. So, um, I like to speak anytime I can about this and awareness, I feel like is so important. You and I are hopefully going to do some, some awareness, you know, um, sessions and stuff out there for folks, because we yeah. both, have, we both have our own experiences in this life and, and viewpoints that are very valuable, I think, um, to be able to help others. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit about me. Um, I think, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, you know, what you said was so valuable that it is two different worlds and, and, you know, what I've noticed because one of my children, you know, um, I actually had two children with disabilities, but one of them was worse than the other. And for that one child who um, had it worse, uh, they were put in more seclusion, secluded classic rooms. Okay. And for them, um, for, for, that, for my one child, that made my one child feel very um, indifferent. And, and, you know, kids would make fun of, of him. And then he would feel that he was, uh, his, his self-esteem definitely went down. I could, you know, he didn't say it, but you could see, and he also was very angry inside and you could tell because he, his temperament was very easy. You could very easily 
he could just snap and get angry very, very quickly. And it wasn't because, um, you know, he was just uh, a, a mean person. It was because he had a lot of anger from the way he was treated and how he felt in school. You know, when children are growing up, they just want to be like everybody else. Well, you know, they want to feel like everybody else. They want to be, you know, included in that. And, you know, our society, we have an environment where we feel like everyone has to be the same. And we don't. It's better to be unique than than to be, you know, and to stand out than to be the same. But when you're growing up as a child, you're still trying to find yourself and you don't want to feel like you're less than somebody else. And when you put get put into these classes, you, you know, sometimes children, other children, you know, can be very mean and make you feel like you're, you're less of, of who you are, or they build it up in their head. And that could lead to anger, frustration, depression. And, you know, if, and one of the things I say to people too, is if you see your child sleeping a lot, it, it, it might not be because they're tired. It could be, might be because they're depressed, you know, and, it is harder to find friends when you're like, you know, when you have those challenges and, you know, as a parent, it's our duty to, to really try our hardest to boost our child, make them feel special, give, pump them with positivity and show them what their strengths are and then utilize it and then build upon it. Because I think they, we really need to build that, those, those things that those strengths about our child, let them see how valuable it can be to them and to the world and let them build on it and make themselves feel like they're special. Cause once they feel good about themselves, that's all they need and they will fly. And what I've noticed, I don't know about you, Mary, but I noticed when I was trying to advocate for my child, there's a lot of parents that are in denial or they use very harsh language and they put down their child. And, you know, those children, you know, you know, they, they grow up not feeling good about themselves and then they kind of get lost in society and they don't be, they don't go elevate to the higher levels and they don't become, you know, reach their full potential because of the way they were treated as a child. It all starts as childhood, just like a puppy. When you get a puppy, if you, if you shower that puppy with love, that puppy throughout its whole life will shower you back and shower your family back with love. But as soon as you, that puppy comes through the door, if you show meanness to that puppy, you're going to have one angry dog the rest of your life in that home. So the moment your child is conceived in, and you know, they, they say in, 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 in science, it's not even when the child is conceived, it's when the child is in, inside you. If that's where it all begins from the moment of conception. And, and when you're, you know, that's, and then when your child is comes out and your child is, is, is born, it's our duties as parents, I think, to really show our children that, you know, they are special. They have qualities. Look at this about you. Look at that about you. You're wonderful. That's terrific. How do you feel about all that? I know it just, I gave you, I threw out a lot of info right now, but as you were saying that, it just all came to my head and I just felt like it was necessary to share it. But how do you feel? Yeah, no, no, I agree with you hundred um, percent because, you know, we have, I think if we pour, when we pour into our children until they can pour into themselves, because they don't know what they're capable of. Yes. But they try. And if we encourage them, they're going to try more. And I, just, you know, with my kiddos on the spectrum, I just don't say no, that you, you can't do that. I want you, I do want you to try it as long as it's healthy and good for them. Right. So, uh, mom, I'm always encouraging them, you know, just, Hey, we're going out, you know, you want to try soccer? Let's try soccer. You want to try this? We're going to try this. You know, let, let's try it. Let's try drums. Let's try an instrument. Let's, yeah. you know, let's, let's do those things. I do believe that the way I've raised my kids, I've used a lot of music and arts with my children because children on the spectrum tend to be highly, highly creative. And um, for those children who are nonverbal, using words or have, having them write, draw, things like that, they can express what's happening inside them mm -hmm. that they can't actually say. Like my oldest daughter was really, really just awkwardly shy. And it's so funny now today, she's not like she was, you know, but as a child, she was to the point where I used writing with her so she could express to me how she was feeling. Right. Say it. And even now these days, if she's like, mom, I'm trying to process because they know all the language my kids do. And yeah. so um, she's like, I'm really trying to process. I said, okay, just, if you need to write it down for me, then just write it down for me. Okay. Right. Now she's a songwriter. She's a music major and <clears throat> 
she writes beautifully. It's so amazing. So deep and just really connected. And so I'm glad she had that outlet for her to process my middle daughter who went through the, um, the trauma, she had been drawing since she was like 18 months old. And so art was her channel in her life to process her trauma. And so I can't even imagine the condition she would be in today if she did not have that channel in her life. Yeah. Now, all children need a channel of some sort that is very healthy and <clears throat> it has boundaries they can go out of, but it's still safe for them. Yeah. Um, sports are very important. So athletics, academics, and the arts, I think are three very important things to raise your children with. Yes. It helps them use both sides of the brain. It helps them to take in uh, information, nine, the nine different ways that we take in information, use all of their senses because we're intended to, yeah. but we're also intended to be creative, you know? And so I, I feel like it helped my children process through some pretty significant stuff and not end up screaming, I hate you, slamming doors. I want my room painted black so I can sit in there and go into a deep depression Right. Because their emotions are like this. I don't care who the kid is, right? Oh, for sure. No, 100%. Even the most stable home is can't have a child who's like this, right? Because yeah. we're talking about the spectrum and we're talking about autism, ADHD, things like that. You know, there is a very significantly high chance your child will have d- d- anxiety and depression because it yes. goes along with it. Yes. So, when you've got a kid who their emotions are already like this, and then you throw all that in, you're going to have a lot like this. And especially a child who is not sure, how do I, how I'm feeling? And of course, you know, in middle school, I, I, I really saw this so much with my oldest there's, and I see it with others in middle school. Um, they're so self-absorbed because it's the stage they're in. Yes that they don't realize that majority of their friends are all going through the same thing. Yes. They only think they're, they think they're the only one. So we have to talk to them about that. Right. But I will tell you when my kid, my girls were younger, I tried an experiment with them and um, I decided to, instead of focusing on the things they weren't doing or the getting in trouble or not cleaning their room or doing chores, whatever it was, your typical average stuff in life, yeah. I decided to let's go with, let's do reverse psychology and let's just go the positive route. So I went into that and then I saw a change in my children and the relationship with my children. Yeah. And it was, I was like, okay, so there are people out there missing this with their kids because starting to, like you were saying earlier, if we tell our kids all that positive stuff, now they have to have reality in there too. I'm yeah. not saying we need to fluff them up to think they're so perfect that then yeah. <laughs> one day. So we've got to exactly find that balance, you know, hundred percent. Yeah. So <laughs> we're not saying, you know, go all the way over this direction. Yes. What we're saying is that we have to do that for them till they can figure that out themselves. So they can feel encouraged enough to believe themselves because children are full of self-doubt. Yes. Um, especially children who come from any kind of trauma, maybe a birth trauma, uh, <clears throat> genetic, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's in the genes hundred uh, percent, or any kind of challenge. So when I poured positivity into them, I saw them rise to that. So they're going to show up yeah. when you're talking about them because kids have that attention bucket, good or bad, mm-hmm. got to be full right. every day. Right. So yeah. you wonder why does that kid keep acting so bad? Why is his behavior, her behavior so bad behaviors, communication, it's something mm-hmm. a lot of us forget. So if you are constantly yelling at that child, putting them down, telling them how bad they are, how wrong they are, blah, 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 you're still giving them attention. Yes. Now they have come to be conditioned to this. So, okay, my dad or mom or my aunt, grandma, whoever's raising them. Okay. They pay attention to me when I'm being bad. So right. that's what I'm going to do. And it's really that simple, but we yeah. don't, think about it being that simple word, like we're, we feel almost like a victim at the throes of why are you being so bad? Right. Well, why don't you sit down and talk to this child? What is happening for this child? If they can't talk to you, then tell them, you know, run, dance, work it out, write it out. You know, I mean, play it on an instrument, something until you can get to that place that you can go, okay, now I can talk about it. 
Yeah. We have to give our kids tools for processing. If my 10 year old, I love his OT therapist. That's his occupational therapist. She has used a program with him and I can't tell you the name right now because I have forgotten it, but she uses a program with him that is socially, emotionally, mentally based. And it, it teaches him what's happening in his body. So he understands upset tummy, a headache, a tightness in the chest, uh, whatever it is, he can start to understand, okay, so this is an emotion here. I need, to, I need to address. Excellent. And so he can, when he, I've had the experience with him, he's bouncing off the, I'm like, buddy, what's happening with you? I'm just so excited, you know? And it's like, okay, so listen on talk about why are you so excited? So you can diffuse situations so mm -hmm. much easier. I'm not saying this is like, you get it the first time you try it with a child. Oh yeah. You got to work it out with your child. I mean, I, I learned, and I think as moms and, and dads too, we have to turn into our intuitive self. We yes. have to turn into that mother instinct that what that God gave us that instinct. Oh, okay, baby. I'm sorry. My little guy's here with us today. So, yeah. <laughs> so we say hi to my little guy, but anyways, um, hi, little guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we, we have to, and I lost my train of thought. So can you remind me? <laughs> We were talking that, that, you know, we really have to use our intuitiveness. We do. We, I, I learned that very early on. It doesn't mean I'm, I do it all the time. Sometimes I forget you go into uh, your emotions take over, right? Yes. So, but when I would tune into that mother instinct I, and anytime I've not listened to it, when it's come in, it's, you know, there's been consequences for it, but yes. Like with him, when he was little and he couldn't communicate very well, because the two of them weren't, two of my kiddos on the spectrum were nonverbal, right? Uh, mostly, or it was an audible, like you couldn't understand what they were saying. Um, I would come down to his level. I would put my hand on his belly and his back and just try, just, just apply gentle pressure, like a hug. And I would take my tone under his and it would diffuse the situations 99.9% .9 of the time. So we didn't go through these horrendous temper tantrums yeah. that you could go through, or we could have gone through with him. And that was my instinct kicked in for me. And, and I tried it once and I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. That was like amazing because yeah. he didn't feel threatened by the change of my voice. Like even now at his age, he's very tuned in to the inflection tones in my voice. Like he has mm -hmm. a teacher at school and he's like, mom, I can tell she's mad or I don't think she likes me. Mm -hmm. And it's the inflection that kids really are tuned into that we don't realize. Right. Um, and so we, we need to, um, we've just got to, we have to monitor ourselves for that, you know? Um, yeah. but also if we just, if you think about, I used to give this example. Sometimes you have two children. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give my girls as an example, right? So my oldest, if I went in when she was like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, I'd go in in the morning and say to her, she was not a morning person. <laughs> and I would say, okay, honey, what do you, what shirt do you want to wear? The white one or the blue one? And she went, I want to wear the white one. And I yeah. just gently back out of the bedroom, leave her alone. And I'd be like, but I, I, I really, every morning I hated waking her up for school because this is what I was going to get the Tasmanian devil. Right. Yeah. 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 I had to figure out what to do with that. So, but my point is she could say that and it make me go like this. And then my other one can be just so sweet and soft and you just give them the world. Yeah. And the way we talk to people really, really does affect the way we react to somebody, the way we're oh, supposed to hundred percent. I know. <laughs> so we, we don't realize that with our kids, we take for granted. I should be able to talk to you the way I want to. Right. No, no, no. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, because then we teach them to do that. Yeah. We don't want to teach them to do that. We want no. to teach them to be mindful. How, yes. How do I sound when I talk to you? Right. You know? And I think we have to realize too, that every person is different. So how I talk with one child is not going to always work with the other child. Like I have three children with three completely different personalities. Yes. They, they may look alike 
but they are three different, totally personalities. So when I could talk to one child a certain way, but then I have to talk to the other child a certain way. And then I know I could talk to this child. I have to be a certain way because they all take in things differently. I have one child, very easygoing, very open to anything. I have one child who I have to be, you know, I know where my limitations are, like how I can say things, you know, I have to reword things a little bit. And, and then I have another child that's super sensitive about everything. And then just sometimes overanalyzes everything. So I have to be really super, super careful with my communication with that child and really word things completely different than the other two, because, you know, I think parents have to realize that each child, even though they, they know that each child might be different, we have to also communicate differently because communication is key. And the way we speak to them has a humongous impact. And also like when you were talking, I also realized that I have to just throw out this statistic that 70% of the United States families come from dysfunctional families. And you, the, you know, from the moment, you know, it all starts at the root. And so if we had things going on in our life that may have been negative or communication with our parents may not have been good, now is the time to really step and, and try to think about, okay, you know, my mom did this with me and I know it didn't work. And sometimes I see myself doing that, not intentionally. So maybe I need to work on myself as a parent because there's always time as a parent to work on ourselves. You know, nobody is perfect. And if something is not working well, or you see yourself doing some negative behaviors because just you grew up in that type of family, Take a step back, take a breather, maybe walk out of the room and say, how can I do this better with my child? Because, you know, for me, I had two children with disabilities and I, you know, it, you know, it was, it was, it was a task because I had to, both of them had to be treated completely different and, you know, and, and, you know, to this day, I still have to do things differently, but, you know, I noticed sometimes, you know, I might do things because that's the way I was brought up. But now I'm in a totally different life. I'm in my own family. So I have to sometimes if I catch myself doing something that not, might that could be done better, I have to realize I'm a parent. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. How can I make this situation better? How can I communicate better with my child? How could I get better results? And then, you know, and be honest with yourself. Maybe I didn't come across really well because I said it this way and I could have said it that way and it probably would have been better, you know, and, and accept that, you know, you're not perfect and you make mistakes and then just try to redo it. And I think your child will appreciate that too. Mm, absolutely. A hundred percent. And I was going to say the other thing that really, one of the reasons I had to change my parenting because after the trauma that my daughter went through, uh, I couldn't parent her the same way that I was previously. Yeah. Um, if anybody raised their voice at, at all, she cowered. Yes. She'd been screamed at, right? Yes. Um, the, the, the trauma she went through lasted for eight months before we found out. Mm-hmm. So in being almost being non verbal enough to be yes. able to talk to us about what was happening till the police department called us to let us know what had occurred, what mm-hmm. the investigation was. But we had to, you can't use timeout on a child like that. You can't use a loud voice. You can't use dire consequences mm-hmm. um, because they've already been, they've been traumatized at the hands of someone else. And so exactly, I really, I, I had to get on my knees. I had to pray for help because yeah. I was, I was in a, in a world that at that point that mm, I wasn't sure what to do exactly you know? Um, yes. and, um, it, I'm glad that it helped open my eyes to, um, just see that there's just a better, different way to do things that you can still get, um, the same or, or results from, but just to do it a little differently. And, you know, I also realized too, is that, I, I, you know, through counseling and coaching people, there's a lot of adults that re- didn't realize that they had autism, that now, because autism is such a 
more popular topic and is talked about more and there's more research being done, people are realizing that they could be on the spectrum. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, I even had one person that I was working with and they realized it was, it was in there. They probably were going into their forties and they realized that like probably late thirties, early forties, they realized that they had, they were on the spectrum of autism and now they're going to get help for it. But, you know, all these years, because autism was not talked about, they didn't realize until they got older and they realized that, you know, their thinking habits or the way they were reacting was differently. And then they went and they got help. And then it was brought up by specialists that it looks like you might be on the spectrum of autism. So there could be a lot of parents out there parenting their children that have autism. If they hear some of these symptoms that you're describing, they could themselves be on, you know, on the spectrum themselves. And if they do think that they may have some symptoms that are related to autism, maybe they should speak to somebody because that could interfere with their parenting skills as well. And maybe if they have a child that's autistic, they might be, you know, if they might carry some, you know, have autism also, but maybe it's on the spectrum, it's very mild, but it's worth, you know, checking out if you fe don't feel right and you see behaviors that are irregular in yourself. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. I, I'm hearing more and more stories about people who are adults now going, oh my God, now my life makes so much more sense to me why I did this, why I was like that. I always felt like so strange or weird or an oddball or an outcast. And now I know why. And so that, <laughs> that brings us back to why are there so many individuals? Like I know when I did research not too long ago for an article, um, in the eighties, I think diagnosis was one in a hundred thousand. It didn't mean it didn't exist more than that. It just meant that was the diagnosis rate at that time. Yeah. One in 36. So um, I read an article too that said autism usually comes through the male line. Oh, um, really? um, and I do know that my children and I have all been uh, genetically tested. Uh, I had to get tested after having my, my son because I had him late in life. So at right. 45, after having him, I was desperate for some hormonal balance, yes. you know? Like, mm -hmm. no, please help me. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so she said, well, let's do some genetic testing because I let's make sure, let's see what kind of hormones you can use. Because my mother had blood clots and was not able to take the birth control pill. And then oh, okay. I had a blood clot uh, in my twenties was, and they took me off birth control. And right. so she said, okay, let's do some specific testing. So MTHFR was what came back. Mm -hmm. And I have a gene from both parents, heterozygous, homozygous. So uh, I decided to have my three kids tested and there is a high link between MTHFR and autism. Okay. Um, and, uh, my oldest has got the same two genes I do. And then my other two kids, one has one and one has the other. Okay. And so the reason that it's important to know this, and, and actually I was just talking to my chiropractor about this yesterday, and he was saying that they are finding the population of our world is the diagnosis for MTHFR, which is a gene mutation. It means the body doesn't methylate and break down like it's supposed to. Right. Something that occurs in the liver. And when you're not utilizing the minerals and vitamins that you need, then your body's going to lack, you know, um, it's not going to react the same way. You know, a person with MTHFR is going to, um, they're going to have more toxins in their body. It's going to be harder for them to get them out. Uh, they're going to react more to medications uh, and drugs. Um, they are um, um, going to have a harder time getting over uh, ailments and things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it also, there's a lot of other connections too. But the important thing for knowing it is that then you can take the right things for it. Right. Like we, we use a supplement from the doctor that's specifically for M MTHFR. It's MTHFR care. So all the vitamins in it are methylated, which means the body breaks it down easier. It doesn't have to do such hard work or you don't even get to use it at all. You mm -hmm. know? So uh, like my father, when he passed away in 2019, he had Parkinson's supranuclear palsy and dementia. Oh, wow. Now he obviously had MTHFR because I've got it from both parents.
If he had known that he had that gene, he could have used the right things for it and may not have either had those three things or maybe they wouldn't have been as significant as they were. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, cause like B12, for instance, you have to use a methylated B12 Okay. For, for the body to absorb it. You can't just use straight B12. It'll just go right through. Right. So like if I get a B12 shot, it has to be something called methocobalamin. And, uh, that is a methylated form of B12 so that my body will use it appropriately. Like it's supposed to and right. be vitamins for our brain and all that fun stuff. Um, so awareness of this, it kind of, it really helped change some of the things I also did with my family and, and understanding how their bodies work, you know, um, because it is connected to certain things, you know, uh, but in the research that I did, um, I just found it so fascinating that there was so little diagnosing going on a long time ago. Now it's so much higher. Yes. You know, we have so many adults now saying, like you said, you know, I think I'm on the spectrum as well. And mm. I think we're all on the spectrum. All of us are somewhere. Yeah. We all fall in there. There's high functioning, middle functioning or low functioning. Right. So we're all in there. It's just, where are you on there? Yeah. Um, you know, because um, you've got some of the smartest people in the world that could not even hold a conversation with another human being. That's correct. They were creating and coming up with all these equations, right? Yes. They couldn't lead a normal life, but that doesn't, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just the way their brain processes. Einstein was one of them. Absolutely. As one of the guys I'm talking about. So, <laughs> uh, and I know my poor middle daughter, when she was in seventh grade, eighth grade, she was trying to tell her, the friends at school, my brain just processes differently than you. Yeah. So instead of them hearing her, what she was saying, she was able to she was advocating for herself. I love that. I love how she said that, you know, she's not saying that she's different or she has a disorder or she has a condition. I just process things differently. I'm right. just like you, but I just process things a little bit differently. That is a amazing answer that like, that like makes me excited because I love how she described it. That shows how wonderful you're doing as a, as a parent yourself. These techniques are fabulous because yeah. she's looking at herself. She's not looking at herself as a different person. She's not right. looking at herself as an outcast. I'm just like you. I just process things a little bit differently. I love it. I just absolutely love it. <laughs> well, I was really proud of her for that. That what I wasn't proud of is the reaction to the gr the girls had. Oh, well, you think you're smarter than us? Oh. So she didn't really know how to answer that because that's not what she was saying. No, it was not. So she wasn't ready with a comeback of saying that was their insecurity. Funny. Right. And, and so I was so proud of her for being able to say that now my, my little guy, he has not come from an environment that he thinks anything is wrong Yeah, it's that he understands his brain processes differently. Cause he talks about how his brain processes and his conversations are very interesting, but he also hasn't really known to ask questions about it until the last year and a half. Right. And then we started having lots of conversations about it. Mm -hmm. So it's that that's been, I, I guess I took for granted for a long time. I didn't know when we were going to have these conversations and now we're having them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes so. it, it takes like, even with, with, as you get older, as you start to get more developed and, it, and boys tend to mature a little bit slower too than girls. And now he's at a stage where he, his, his, his brain and his awareness is, is, has advanced and he's starting to process a lot of things that he didn't process before, but that all comes with just aging, developing maturity, and just a grown, you know, understanding, you know, as we develop, as our brain develops, we process things more easily. It's just like you can't a fifth grader, you know, a first grader can't process a fifth grader's work. You know, it's just as right. time goes on, we develop and we, we are able to process the things we couldn't process before. Right. Cause there was no, I don't think he had an awareness for it, but he also comes from an environment who that celebrates it. Yes. Um, like his old school that closed in May and we had to find a new school this year, which was really hard. Um, but his old school, we literally, um, you 
we had to, um, I mean, we would celebrate World Down Syndrome Day in March and we would celebrate World Autism Awareness Day on April 2nd. And then we would do like a sensory wide, um, um, a sensory, a school wide sensory uh, thing with all the kids. Mm-hmm. You could all feel what that was like, you know? That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> my little one. I love him. Anyways, mm-hmm. he's my, he's my little me, my little mini me. Uh, yeah. You know, but, uh, I, I, I'm glad that he's asking questions and he's like, I'm glad I'm autism. And I'm like, okay. So then we had to have that whole conversation. So you're, you, you don't, you, you not, you aren't it, you, you have it. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, we aren't a dog, but we have a dog right? You know, kind of thing so that he can understand. But He's learned so much because he's been in therapy since he was 18 months old. Now I, I found his little book. I journaled for all three of my children and they were through the birthing process and everything. Yeah. So I found my, my journal for him the other day and I was reading it. And I, I, cause just recently he asked me, he wants to know about his birth. Yeah. So I told him the whole story. It's, it's, there's quite a bit to it. Um, and, um, he, I forgot, like I knew I had intrauterine growth restrictions. So he stopped growing in utero, but I forgot that he was delayed in his development as well in utero. And so it's finally why they took him, they brought him out. Yeah. Um, and then it took us several days to get him to latch on. He could not swallow. So we had to teach him how to swallow when he was born. Right. Um, and then he wasn't growing after he was born. So I was like pumping and we were giving formula both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he's still lower on the chart, you know, for height and weight, but he's healthy, Yeah, you know, he's healthy weight and height. Um, but we have to remember that, that, you know, when you're, when you're raising a child with a development that's delayed, because mm-hmm. this happened to both my middle and my, my, right. Both, my daughter and my son were developmentally delayed, but when you have that going on, you're going to, you're going to raise them differently. You have to, you have to for sure. Okay. I just sneezed. And so I was like, I'm going to block that out. But anyways, uh, I'm going to mute myself for that sneeze, but, uh, we, um, we, we just, you know, it, it's, it's so important for us to, to be tuned into our children, to assess what their needs are, to also teach them how to be independent, how to be independent thinkers, how to be resilient to overcome. Because yeah. cause being on the spectrum and having disability challenges of any kind, you are going to have to be an overcomer. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and we have to teach them that because we don't know what our future looks like. We want them to be able to be resilient in their yes. life. And, and those are, those are life skills that are just, you can't put a price on those. No, you can't. And I think it's very important for the parents to take part in that. You know, even when I was growing up, my mother always gave me encouragement and she always told me, don't let anyone make you feel indifferent. You can do it. You're, you're, you can do anything you put your mind to. And she just pumped positivity in me when I was growing up with epilepsy because of all the struggles and obstacles that I endured. And, you know, I think, you know, it, it did make an impact, you know, like, I don't think, I don't even remember her saying all these things. Like I briefly, certain things might come into my head, but I think probably her positivity and making me feel good about myself probably helped me along the way because I never, you know, I always had it, but I never felt, you know, I I didn't feel indifferent. I think, I think sometimes I wanted to be more accepted and I saw myself when I was younger, being more of a follower than a leader. And then later I realized, you know, when I started to talk about my disability, I started to realize that, you know what, I'm actually proud because now I'm helping others, you know, and I, I switched from being that follower to a leader. And so in a way it made me stronger, you know, and I think that that's a thing we have to tell people, people with autism, people with disabilities, people with any kind of conditions, you know, don't look at it as a weakness, take it as a strength, use your experiences, pull the positivity out of every struggle you've been through and use it as a strength and make good of it. I said, you know, I, I say, be an advocate, 
do something, do something to help others, help yourself and then go out there and use it to help others. And you know, how great would the world be if you could work on yourself, maybe have people support groups, people like you, other people strengthening them and getting them to a point where they feel so good about themselves that they can go out and help other people with similar situations. And we keep helping each other and we, as a community and we grow and we be, we become stronger and we feel good about ourselves. Can you imagine how amazing the world could be if we took out the hatred, if we took out the stigmatism, if we took out the labels and we use this in a positive sense, you know, if people started to take out the negativity out of their lives and start putting positivity, let's be positive. Let's, let's help help each other. Let's be a strong community. How great would that be? People have um, to realize come, it's all about coming together. It's not about hatred. It's not about labelizing. It's not about stigmatism and grouping each other into all these different groups. It's about coming together as one. That's how right. it's all going to work. Well, and it's also about sharing your different cultures and loves and, you yeah. know, in like, taste and things and you know well, you're gonna like some you may not like others and it may not you know but it, it's so cool to be exposed to those things oh yeah for I sure mean, you know I know there's the old way of thinking of like uh, well I know in the hills I know in the country of the United States in the middle I mean I'm yeah from Florida but I live in Tennessee so Tennessee North Carolina Alabama Georgia this area is like my people and mm -hmm. so they don't really like to go outside their people, like the older folks do. Like my, yeah, husband, yeah. my husband's grandmother would say, oh, I know you have to go see your people. <laughs> like, so it's kind of so offensive to me. Like, like I was doing the worst thing, going to see my mom. You yeah. Know? So I know there's that mentality that's out there and there's even worse, we know. But, yeah. you know, it's really not the way the world was designed to be. It's no. not what the intention was the intention yeah. was for us to be open-minded we have to expand our awareness our yes. awareness has been so compressed mm -hmm. through periods of time you know that horrendous things that have happened in our history oh yeah so now is a really great time for us to expand our awareness about many things and yeah. expand our awareness about ourselves Hey, how can I be the better version of myself? What do I need to, I think that's tremendously scary for people to take yes. ownership tremendously, especially oh, for sure. Narcissist. You know, I mean, narcissists, we have to pray for. Yes. Um, and sorry, I'm calling you out. You exist out there. I know that. Oh yeah. I, I have family members that are narcissists and yes. I know people, you know, and, you know, that, are, I, you know, that are in our groups, in our circles, you know, and they are narcissistic, but you know, what only we could do is pray because, you know, that's a very hard barrier to, to try to change. It's not narcissist that you, you really can't, that's a disorder in itself that they have to approach and get help for. So yeah. all we can do, like you said, is pray and really, right. I know one who's recovering and I still have to call him out on things. Yeah. No, that's, you're still being, no, you know, <laughs> yeah. There's more room in this room for opinions than just yours. Yes, so, exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, and I, I'm so concerned that we're, we're raising a society of narcissistic kids, young adults, because everything is so selfie me, this selfie me, that uh, video about myself, video about what I'm doing. So yeah. it's making everyone think they're more important in an egotistical way than what, what they're doing is really important. Um, I've, I've noticed that myself. And even when I've worked with younger generations, like uh, on projects, I, I feel like the lack of respect, you know, it's like, I, I was brought up to, to respect. And I was always, I, I, this is how I brought my children up, but I see that like, you know, in the twenties and 30 years old, when I have to work with them, some of the things that come out of their mouths, I just look at them and I'm like, excuse me. Well, but the questioning, like, I was so excited to send my, well, I was, I mean, I was, sad for her to go, but I was also excited for the college time. Right. Yeah. 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 But what I, but we know what colleges are doing is what I feel like society is doing is it's not promoting the family. It's not promoting the family unit. It's, it's, it's like, I I've heard my older daughter and some of her friends, the way they talk about parenting and things that we do that are like normal for us to do. Yeah. Like, 
either questioning it, they're judging oh, yeah, it, I they're like, that. oh, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, yes, I can. And yeah. Paying your bills and taking care of you, I can do that. Yes. So there's this whole generation that is, I, I, it's just, it's really shocking to me what we're, what I'm seeing out there and, and just like, um, well, they're talking about, they're talking about parenting techniques, these new parenting techniques, but these new parenting techniques are mentioned in, just like you said, the me generation, and it's not going to help these children. It's going to actually harm these children because you, you don't know, say no to your child. They don't learn what their no. boundaries are. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, my mom has a psychology background and I remember when the girls were younger, she said to me, she said to me many times, right. Hoping to get it into my mind, which it did get there. Cause I used it. If you don't say no to your children, they never learn how far they can go or can't go. But also children do not want to be the parent or the adult. They want you to be that because yes. consciously they have got to have that telling Guidance. them what's okay, what's not okay, what I should do, what I shouldn't do until they can figure it out themselves. Exactly. You know, and so it's, it, even though a kid doesn't want to hear no, and even if you have a child, like I have two that ask me no, and then it gets asked about a hundred more times <laughs> or when I stop and say, you do it again, I'm going to- I think that's even kids without autism because, you know, I- No, I, yes, I, it's just, that. that's just a <laughs> defiant thing, right? Yes. But I'm saying when you have a child like that, yeah, um, you know, it you, you just have to keep saying, no, sorry, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I know you want what you want when you want, when you want, yes. when you, you want what you want, when you want it and you can't understand. No, there is an yeah. entire generation of these children. And it's like, sorry, so sad. You don't get everything in life. We can't have, you know, when you get older, you understand the way things are, you can manifest things, right? Just manifest right. good. Let's manifest good. Right. But you have to hear no, because there are all these in-between little interests intricacies that we have to learn. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, my, my oldest would be like, why do we have laws, mom? And even my youngest has asked this question. Well, I would say to her, if we all come to the stoplight at the same time, there's going to be a wreck and nobody's going to get anywhere. So we have mm -hmm. to follow the rules. I have to. Yeah, it's true. You know, in, in our, you know, the next time we do a podcast together, I would love to tap into, now you were talking about parenting, but I would love to talk to parents about being caretakers because I feel like it's a, it, this is a whole different discussion. So I don't want to bring it up right now in this podcast, but as a, you are a caretaker to mm -hmm. two children with autism, and I don't think people recognize the the difficulties and the responsibility and the emotional um how hard it is it's not it's emotionally hard on you it's it's yeah. physically draining you know as much as you love your children it's a lot of work and then you're probably yes. trying to do your own career you probably have your family to take care of you have to be a wife you have to do this you have to run errands you have to and so it's it's a combination of trying to live a normal life and then have two children that you're a caretaker for mm -hmm. and this goes on in all different conditions. And, you know, my husband, you know, and my parents, I didn't realize what they went through till later in life when I had to be a caretaker to three of my relatives who were dying. And then I realized the amount of responsibility and how emotionally draining it can be as much as you love the person. It's a big job being a caretaker. And maybe in our next podcast together, and maybe if we, if when we do our seminars, because we'll be doing seminars in the future together, we could discuss that because I think there's a lot of people out there that take care of children with autism, that take care of ch people, you know, or elderly or older people or people that have a, a condition or a disorder or a disability and it, they need support. And mm, maybe absolutely. that's something we can go over, you know, when we speak next time, because I think they need support. And maybe I think we would be great advocates to help them with some of our suggestions. So sorry to draw you off the, the conversation, but that no, I think it's my perfect. mind when we were talking. Well, it, it's perfect. And even like my former stepmother, I say former because my father's passed away now, but he with the three things that he had. And he, he reverted back to a child, right? She had never had children. 
So she'd never taken care of anyone before. Yeah. So I would give her advice or send her things that I was doing for my own child. Right. Like, this is what you have to do. Like now that he has accidents, you got to take him to the potty every two hours. Right. I, he's 80. You still got to do it. Exactly. And, you know, and yes. it is like having a little child around. Yes. So, but she was exhausted from all of it. And I said, yes, this is what it's like. Yeah. Is it, it is a continual, continual exhaustion. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, it just, it goes on and on and on. And yeah, we didn't have grandparents around to help my husband and I didn't. So I did the majority of everything, you know, yeah. went to work. I took care of the kids and it's still, so it's still that way. Yeah. So I've told my kids, you need to live near us. You will need our help when you have children. And you oh, for sure. Us. You will not want us hours away, especially the middle of the night, those emergencies. Everybody has them when you have a child. Yes. Everybody does. I, I thank God that my parents and my in-laws live nearby and they were the greatest help because it was really a lot of work, but I always could rely on one of them to help me. They were always in, in arm's length. And they were always willing to help out whenever they could. And that help was a lot because you don't realize how much, you know, everything, how much work in parenting is involved. And so it is good to have family members. I And I talk to people who don't have that support and it's very difficult for them. It's a yeah. lot of work when you don't have support of your family near you and it's all on you and your partner. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a long, it's a lonely road. It's a lonely road. Yeah. Now tell some people about all the different things you do, because you do so many different things, helping others and you have your own column and you write and you, you know, tell people some of the things that you offer and how you can help others. Um, okay. Well, I have my children's books and, um, they're on my website, Mary E. Um, or they're on Amazon and, you know, those to me are, uh, I, I, you know, I have, I am pages in those, uh, the, the, we've just re-released the first two and we've just re-released the first two in the series. Um, and I really love those because it helps families get started on a positive language with their children. Yes. Like I am love. I am joy. Look at me. Look what I can do. I'm so wonderful. My mom thinks I'm perfectly made. It's about how you come into the world and helping your child accept them for who they are, how they came into this world. Love that. And those were inspired by my son who came in very challenged in a very challenging way. Yeah. We survived his birth, both of us. So that's where that came from. Um, I have some stuff on my website for advocacy. I am putting more and more things up there. I actually want, I'm, I'm working on a book for parents and I'm going to have it up there soon. And it's about advocating for your child, whether they have a challenge or not. Excellent. And then a book about positive parenting, you know, how to, we have to change the way we parent so that we are more effective in a positive way, yes. you know, helping mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And that's really, really, really important for our children and the future. Cause we don't, we don't want to keep putting broken people out in the world. We want to no. stop, that. you know, yes. we want to, we, we, I have brokenness in my family on my mother's side, on my father's side, my husband has it on his mother's side. And we're just like, we're done. We're done. You know? So, mm -hmm. so we really want to, uh, bring better, healthier humans up in this world. Yes. So, so um, the advocacy work, you know, I help parents figuring out through like early diagnosis, um, you know, how, what to do after you have a diagnosis, what to do about going to get services in schools. Um, you know, if anybody's interested in, in getting their library more sensory friendly, you know, please yeah. contact me because I've done it several times now. And, um, actually I was just on the, the, the channel five news two weeks ago because congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. It was so amazing. And the segment turned out amazing. And there's been so much positive response to it. Uh, we went to the Nashville Public Library and uh, and did a segment on the sensory room that's there that was created, um, which I was really excited to be a part of. Um, and um, I have podcasts and yes. live streams. And I really, it's always important to me to, um, I swear, Stacy, almost every day I run, if I'm out or, or talking, I meet somebody, I'm like, I need to interview you for the, uh, the disability world, because there's just, yeah. there's so much full 
Right. Did you know there's like, did you know there's a cruise line called autism on the seas? No, I didn't. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I called him. I said, I was going to say you should get on that cruise. And no, I want to interview you people about what you're doing, right? Yeah. They, make that, they have licensed professionals on the ship. Um, evidently the ship's full. They're very, very positive, very, very busy. And then like, uh, the other day there was a uh, Virgin, Virgin hotels. I know here in Nashville is offering, um, a weekend stay $129 a night for families who have children with autism. Wow. To help them have that experience yes. and tell before they go off somewhere. So oh, that's wonderful. Virgin, you know, Virgin Hotels is very, very um I didn't uh, even know about this stuff. Whoa. I know, right? So um, you know, sharing those resources is really, really that's a very important. important yeah. But, yeah. Speaking um wherever I can speak and educate, you know, I'm I'm always looking for those opportunities because I just think it's so important. I, you know, I've been parenting for over 23 years. You've been parenting a long time too, as well. Mm-hmm. And I think longer than I have. And mm. just, we want to take all of that experience and then give back with it. A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. So yeah. I think what you're doing is wonderful. And you also write for wow magazine, right? I do. Yes. Uh, I'm thank you for, yes, bringing it up. Yes. And, and actually my next article is going to be on you and the, <laughs> the angle I'm going for is being the, being the parent with a disability, raising a child with a disability, which is not talked about very much. Like, right. I never really hear those conversations unless someone's telling me their story. Right. You know? So I don't see anything publicly out there about that. And I just think that's a really, really, really important thing to share. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, with, with the autism Tennessee, I get to, um, I'm going to be working, we're going to be working with uh, one of my call, my daughter's colleges to get a college ambassador. Uh, on the campus. Oh, great. Yeah. So that'll be fun. And, um, there is, you know, my girls are music artists, so we're trying to use their music in the, um, the, the platform of bridging diversity and inclusivity. And so we're trying to kind of bring all this together that we do, you know, that's going on in our family, um, to help others in in different creative ways. So, where can you find like I I've I've heard your 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 daughter's music and it's amazing and where can people find it because I think I think people with with either autism or disabilities or any type of condition they would, would they would be so impacted by their music if they heard it where can they find their music so they're they're anywhere music is streamed and sold they are sisters with an s and then j so it's sisters j cuz we're jacksons right right <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so so it's the and we can take the jackson 5 cuz that's already <laughs> We had to go with Sisters J. So uh, <laughs> they are, um, they are uh, anywhere music is sold and streamed. You can find them at sistersj.com online. They are on uh, Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram is Sisters J Music and YouTube as well. Their latest song, Breathe In, has got some autistic kids in it, my son and some other ones, and then some Down syndrome kids. So we're wow. trying to like come together in celebration. Oh, I love it. Breathe in, remember who we are, who God made us to be. And, you know, we just, the girls really want to put love and light out in the world. They want to do it through music. Uh, My middle daughter is an artist. She's in animation and filmmaking. And actually she um, is working on a project with um, a organization out of Dublin, Ireland called Anua Global. And I love them because she's an ambassador for them, a youth ambassador, because what they do is they teach kids around the globe uh, in in underprivileged areas and countries where, you know, they're really struggling. They teach them tools and music and art so that they can use that to make money for their families and villages. Right. Right. Um, so it's a really great organization. And so they have teamed up with uh, um, Skylar Jett is his name. He took over for Lionel Richie, the Commodores in the 80s. Yeah. And Skylar, oh my gosh, he, I just think this is so cool. He lives in the same village, in the same woods as um, the man who created Winnie the Pooh. Oh my gosh. And he created it. It's all from those woods. That was the hundred acre wood. <laughs> so I'm like, I said to Skylar when we zoom, oh my gosh, show me outside. 
let me see outside your window, you know, because uh -huh. both my girls, their, their bedroom, you know, stuff was all Winnie the Pooh. Cause I love Pooh so much, but Oh my God. Yeah. I'm a huge Pooh fan, but, um, the, um, he wrote a song called, now he has an organization called music for global change. He's all about social conscious music, uplifting music. Yeah. So he is teaming up with my girls, but also with Lily, cause she's an animator, uh, to create an animated video to go with the song. It's called mm -hmm. positive vibes. And then they're trying to get kids from 21 different countries to sing the song, to be in the music video. So it'll be animation and then live stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it's, um, it's all about empowering kids. Right. Oh, you know? wow. I yeah. love it. I yeah, love I'm, it. I'm super excited about this project. And, um, you know, we're, we're, I know they're like, come on, let's get it going. And, you know, animation takes a little time and, yeah. but to be a part of that is really quite special. Um, yeah. and, um, you know, the more that we can do to empower our kids and, and I'm saying, you know, here's a child, my middle daughter, she was nonverbal, developmentally delayed, tremendously traumatized at the age of five. And then here she's at college now. And she has written a 500 page novel and is in animation and filmmaking. Amazing. That's me is anything is possible. Yes. That's what she represents to me. Yes. She is one of my heroes. Oh, she is. So. Well, you know what? She got it from you. Your wonderful parenting skills, your supportiveness, your positivity. She's, you know, they're, they're watching their mommy fight for them. They're, they're watching you advocate for them. They're, you know, you're, they're, you're their rock. You're the one supporting them. You're the one who, who is there to catch them. And that means something that goes a long way. It does. So as, as much as you're proud of them, they are proud of you. And together, this is why they are who they are today. Well, let's hope they just keep climbing. They, they just, they, keep, will. they just keep going. So we'll they see will. how uh, the maestro turns out over here. So he's still <laughs> in progress. <laughs> well, if I, if, if, if he's anything like his mommy, I'm sure he's going to, he's going to elevate just like the other two did. Well, I hope so. I, I don't know. He may end up being a YouTuber. I don't know. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because my son was a gamer, my oldest son, and all he did was play video games. Even in college, I could I could hear him playing video games. And I was like, what is this kid going to turn out to be? Well, it happens that he went to college, he became a software engineer. Now he's working with a huge company and he works and he helps the military with cybersecurity and wow. creating software. Now, if you asked me years ago what he was going to do, I had, I was just like, God bless them. I'm, I, I'll be in my basement my best. when he's 30, right? <laughs> He'll be in my basement when he's 30. I hope not, right? I go to give him a kiss and he's like, mom, you're interrupting. I, you almost got me killed. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this kid is getting ready to go to college and he's, he's worried about getting killed on a video game. Oh my God. Okay. And so it's like, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but he turned out to flourish like there was no tomorrow and he's still flourishing and he's still He's still, he, he, he just got a promotion and he's, he's working his way up the ladder and he's 26 and he keeps on going. So, you know what, you know, our kids, they learn from us. They, they learn from us and they take in more than we realize, you know, and is, you know, they like what they like, but they know when it, when it's time to sit down and really be serious about life. And they know from our, from watching their parents how to make good choices. And that's what parents have to do. We have to set the guidelines. We have to show them how to be a good child, how to be a good adult, how to be a good, you know, and, and just set, you know, I learned that it's like, they, they're like, they're, it's, it's, they're like a bird. You can, you can, you can nest them, take care of them, you know, cradle them. And then at some point you got to just let them fly. And, oh they, gosh, you know, so I know. and they're going to fly and you know what, they may have some accidents along the way, but that's what parents are there. We're, we're, we're there to catch them if they need help. And then we're there to cradle them, help them, and then set them on their way again. And that's what parenting is all about. And as long as you're a good parent, you, and you do your best, you know, that's all you can do you know, and, and your children are, are destined to be who they are. And as long as they have good mentors, they will flourish. They will. Yeah. And it doesn't, they don't have to come from privilege. I mean, you know, no, not my at all. Parents divorced when I was young. Yeah. My grandparents died all in one year. We, we were on green stamps for a while. My dad right. left. I mean, my dad was extremely successful in the corporate world, 
but he married that he left us. So, you know, I, I saw, I was raised by a mother watching a mother raise three kids, uh, and work full time. Yeah. And so I thought she was wonder woman. Right? Yeah. She was incredible. So I found myself in my own marriage, ta- re- 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 replaying that, taking it all on, doing it all. And then I had to, oh, okay. Yep. My husband, we got a partner together on everything, you know, yes, yes, but, yes. but I, I didn't get to see that growing up in some of those really important formidable years. So it's really important for, if we want our children to have healthy marriages and relationships, they got to see it in the how home. Oh, hundred percent. They, they got to see hardworking people, but they have to see a, a parent who also takes care of themselves. Yes. Because, you know, we, there's, there's, there's space and room for sacrifice and hard work and what that turns out to be in your life. But yes. so we can't be a doormat and we exactly can't be abused. No, and we can't make excuses for somebody who is not doing their job or mistreating us. Yeah. So, there's so many like aspects. Oh my God, it's the freaking hardest job ever in the world. Is yeah. to, there is nothing that compares to parenting. I don't think so. No, there isn't. You're a hundred percent right. You are a hundred percent right. There's so many things you have to be skilled in. Like yeah. You have to have a certificate that you never get <laughs> and a paycheck yeah. you never get. And there are no books out there with all the surprises that come along with it. So, you know, you can only do your best and that's all, you know, and if Um, not get help, get help, read a book, go to somebody. Yes. I always have to reach out. And, you know, there are a lot of people that are embarrassed to reach out, but reaching out is what got me where I am today. It's so important when you need help, you got to reach out. Don't be embarrassed because I really, I think it was even from my own, my own experiences when I reached out. I realized how many people were just like me that reached back, you know, that's right. when I realized I wasn't alone. It, people, every single one that's listening to this, this podcast, you are not alone. Whatever you're going through in life, I guarantee you there are hundreds of more like you going through the same thing. So right. reach out and I guarantee you people, people will reach back. It, it's just, it will happen. You know, there are people out there. There's those love magnets that will want to see you, you know, succeed. They will want to help you. And there's so many people that could share their story and actually other people's stories and other people's guidance can actually do so much to help. And but you also have to pick yourself up too. You have you to do a hundred percent. It's up to you. It's yeah. all up to you. You know, if you don't do the work and you don't put in the time, it's not going to happen. So you have to be, you have to, you know, you can't rely on others to heal you. You can't rely on others to make you who you want to be. That part is up to you, but they could okay. be people out there to give you direction, help, hope, support. But when it comes down to it, it's all up to you. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. So tell people before we go, just tell people once again, where they can find you and tell them your email address also, because I want people, if they have questions, I want them to be able to email you and maybe ask you some questions about autism, parenting, advocating about the software, about the, the, the teaching and the therapies that we talked about, you know, give people an email address too. Okay, sure. So it's www.maryejackson.com. So it's just my name. And my email is mary at maryejackson.com. So it's very easy. (laughs) (laughs) Try to keep it easy, you know? So yeah, that's my email. And then that's my website. And that's how you can, you know, you can contact me through my email. And I am more than happy to answer questions. This has been amazing. It's always amazing. And, you know, this is not the last that you've seen, Mary. Mary and I are going to be doing a lot of things together. And I hope that you'll stay tuned to see us next time. We're going to be planning a lot of great things to help a lot of great people in this world. So I'm very excited about what the future holds. And, you know, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Once again, Mary, thank you so much. I love having you on the show. I love talking to you. You are an inspiration to me and I just love you so much. Oh, I came right back to you, right back. To you. I'm so <laughs> glad God brought us together. Thank you yes, so much. Yes, me too. Me too. You have a great day. You too. Bye.